Hey, everybody. Welcome to the show. I am Hody Johns. I'm Jordan Kleinsmith. And Brian Wolgamuth will be joining us in just a moment, but uh, he'll, he'll be, he's, on, he's a little bit too busy for you all right now. He's on a call, but this is uh, Enemy of My Enemy. We are doing a gauntlet episode today where we have an interview with somebody. That somebody is, everybody knows her. It's Ashley Shade. Hi, Ashley. Hi, Hody. Thanks for having me. Oh, thanks for coming on. So what we're going to do is we're going to ask you, again, we are a show for left, right, and center libertarians where we debate and converse with each other about various things. So this will be a fun interview because you're going to get pelted with some lefty, righty, and centrist questions. So are are, are you ready for a pelting? <laughs> Absolutely. Bring it on. Awesome. Well, before we start off with that, why don't you tell us about yourself and the position that you're running for? Certainly. So, hi everyone. My name is Ashley Shade. I am currently the chairwoman of Outright Libertarians uh, and the chairwoman of the Libertarian Association of Massachusetts, which essentially acts as the Libertarian Party of Massachusetts. Uh, so, I have been involved with the party for about uh, almost three years now. Now that I'm thinking of it, wow, it's been that long already. Um, and I've been involved in libertarian the, within the party for about three years now. And I am currently running for city council in the city of North Adams, Massachusetts. Small little city with a population just under 13,000 people. We have nine at-large seats open, and they're all up for election at the same time. It is a nonpartisan race, um, which means party affiliation is not on the ballot. And the top nine vote getters get a seat on the council. Wow, that seems like a, a, a rare opportunity for the libertarians to slip in there. Awesome. All right, well, I guess I'll start off with the questions thing, and I'm sure this is one that you're not uh, tired of at, at all. If you're a libertarian and you don't believe in political power, why would you run for political office? Well, that's a great question. Uh, you, you have to run for office in order to actually change laws and help reduce the size and scope of government and how much it interferes or influences your life. In order to make sure that new laws are not passed that do the same thing, you have to be in office. So really, it, it takes being a part of the system and being in office to change laws, change regulations, and prevent uh, new hindrances from being enacted. And so uh, it's really important that we have a message that is strong and resonates with all voters, not just libertarians, uh, and that our message shows them how we can help solve their problems and the things that are important to them while still doing so in a libertarian way. And if we can learn to convey that message and we can learn to do that, we will get elected. And then when we're in office, it's up to us to execute and make sure that we continue to put in legislation and put in work that spreads liberty. Awesome. Jordan, what do you got for well, uh, I guess my my question um, is, in, even though it's a nonpartisan race, um, I, I imagine that it would be difficult. And this is, you know, somewhat speculation on my part. I've never run for local office, but um, as a libertarian, um, it might be difficult to be branded as, say, obstructionist or contrarian if everybody thinks that, say, you're anti-government and you're there to just kind of shut everything down. And I'm just curious where you see the biggest opportunities to bridge gaps, uh, maybe in a more pragmatic way, um, in in with some of those other folks um, that'll, but still maintain maybe some of those core principles. So I'm, I'm curious where you see those opportunities for compromise versus where you see um, things that you really feel a need to hold the line on from, say, a principle perspective. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, it is well known in my community that I'm a libertarian. I publicly announced that I was running for office a couple of weeks ago on March 9th, and it was picked up by the local press. The first headline was that I'm a transgender woman. And the second thing that it said was that I was the former chair of the Massachusetts Libertarian Party, because I was. <laughs> so 
both of those taglines got thrown in. And of course, I, I don't hide the fact that I'm a libertarian. It is well known and documented. And when I talk about libertarian issues on the local level, I, I like to, it really depends on the issue, but one of the one of the issues that we face here in the city of North Adams is a water infrastructure issue. The city's water infrastructure is failing. It has not had proper updates and maintenance in decades, and it is decades beyond where it should have last been for those updates. Um, so one of the things as a, a libertarian that we need to do is solve this sewer issue and, and make sure that we have working sewer water issues in our city. And I want to do so in the most libertarian way possible. I want to make sure that we have a number of bids or ideas going into this project. I want to make sure that it, it requires the least amount of contribution from taxpayers. So it's really about, you know, uh, doing so in a responsible way, getting the job done, making sure that the costs stay low and that, that things are responsibly done and corrected, but also making sure that the people of the city of North Adams get what they need in a properly working sewer system. Um, so, so it's really about, you know, finding those solutions, finding those ideas um, and working with the other legislatures to say, hey, you know, that, that there is going to cost 10 million, but I think I've shaved off 2 million if we do this. And, you know, maybe maybe we find a way to get a sponsor or brand it, you know, whatever it takes to make sure that we can, you know, hey, if we can, if we can get our water treatment facility, you know, sponsored by Google or something, why not, right? The Google water facility, sure. There's a couple million dollars. Good. Thank you for helping us pay this down less money out of the taxpayers. So simple things like that, you know, bringing, you know, ideas that people don't, wouldn't normally think of. Um, some things where I would be hard line against, I would be very hard line against most tax, in, uh, like the tax increases. I, I don't want to vote for a tax increase. Um, and, and so I'm very much against tax increases. I would be very much against, um, I haven't seen this in, in the city, but I would be very much against uh, new, regula new, new regulations similar to have been adopted in Kentucky about um, being able to be arrested or fined for taunting a police officer. Hmm. Uh, I would be very much against any legislation mm -hmm. like that. Absolutely not. You should absolutely be able to tell a police officer no or, you know, whatever. You should not be arrested for just protesting against police. Um, and so, you know, there, there are hardline things there. Um, but mainly, I want to get into office and show people that there are libertarian solutions to problems. Uh, my campaign is focused on three. The water infrastructure is one. But the two main ones are economic development. I want to be a focal point to recruit new businesses to our area and help partner and work with them and also work to reduce the amount of burdens that they have to open and operate. So licensing, zoning, uh, we need to take care of those so we can have more opportunities for businesses to come in and actually do business. Uh, and then the second thing is bringing more awareness to mental health and the different ideas and solutions that we could do to help promote the mental health of the people in our city and help get more access to mental health services for the people in our city. And one of the big things I'd like to talk about there and bring awareness to is telehealth, which is something that COVID has given us that's been a positive. Is the increased access to telehealth is a great thing when it comes to medical providers. Um, so those are some of the areas where, you know, uh, as a libertarian, you know, taxation is theft doesn't work when you're talking to normal voters, when you're right. saying, you know, and while we know that taxation is theft and we don't like it, I also know that I would prefer if there is going to be tax money, that it be at the local level where you can be accountable, where it can be controlled, where it's back in the, the pockets of the people paying it. Um, so, you know, if we're going to have a government that, that taxes, if the taxes are going to exist, I'd rather they didn't. But as long as they do, we're going to work within that system to make sure it's done responsibly. And at the local level, we have a lot of control over that. And we have a control of showing where those monies are going to. And I think that's really important. 
Awesome. What would you say is like the biggest obstacle in your way right now to getting elected? It's early. We don't know what's happening yet. Okay. So uh, <laughs> nomination papers come out April 6th. Uh, so we, we're, we're way ahead of, of the game here. I'm the only declared candidate at the moment. Oh. I declared very early. Um, our mayor had announced that he was not running for re-election. And then it was publicly announced that another city councilor may be running for mayor. A running third city councilor had already said that they were not running for re-election. Um, so there was there was this talk of these things going on. And then we had the issue with the water infrastructure. We actually had an issue with our fire hydrants where um, about, I believe that they initially estimated over 100 of our 600 fire hydrants were out of service and operational. Uh, I believe after assessing, they found now that it's about 50 that need to be replaced. The other ones needed minor repairs to make operational, and they've done that. But it turned into this big issue in the city. We had a fire, a fire department running up and down a hill trying to find a working fire hydrant to put out a house fire. That is a major issue. And so once all these things started getting out in the press, and then we realized the mayor wasn't going to run. We have city councilors saying they're, they're thinking about running for mayor. It was the perfect time to jump in and be like, hey, you, I'm jumping into the city council race. Uh, here's what my plan is. Here's what I want to do. Here's how I'm going to help. And uh, it worked. We ended up getting picked up by the press when we did that. So, uh, you know, we wanted to, to use, the, uh, use the opportunity to jump in the race. So right now, our biggest barrier is that we don't know who else is running yet. Um, I, I'm going to suspect that at least five or six of the incumbents will run again, and the incumbents always get reelected. Uh, and then it's always, you know, who else is going to run that's not an incumbent. So we'll we'll end up seeing. Um, the other barrier that we have is um, the other the other biggest barrier that we have is reaching the individual voters. Um, North Adams is a very aged senior community. And so the COVID scare is real here. People are very frightened to go out. The masks are a big deal. And right now in our community, we wouldn't be able to do door knocking. People here would not be okay with that. They would be very upset if strangers were knocking on their door during COVID. Now we are hoping that by the end of the season, coming closer to September and October, there will be more vaccinations, people will be vaccinated, things will open back up, and things will be, you know, relatively safe and more accepted in the community. However, we have to understand that we have to fulfill the needs of the community and the needs of the voters, um, which means that we're going to have to reach them in other ways. Phone banking, text banking, uh, advertisements, both online, through television, through radio, billboards. We're going to have to do a lot more of that. And so right now we are trying to raise money for their campaign. The great news is our goal is $5,000. It's a very, very doable goal. As of today, we've already raised almost $2,100 or over $2,100. Uh, we are trying, so we're at 42% we're of our fundraising goal before even pulling out papers for nominations. Um, no candidate in North Adams election has ever spent more than $2,100. So we've already raised more money than anyone's ever spent. But knowing that we're in a COVID age and knowing that door knocking may not be available, we really have to, we really have to outgain that and make sure that we have the resources that we need to reach our voters. We need to be able to send out multiple mailers. We need to be able to make those phone calls and texts. We need to be able to run those advertisements. So the other big barrier is making sure that we can communicate with the constituents and get the mm -hmm. information to them and paying for it. So we could use a lot more donations. <laughs> go, go ahead and throw that link in there if you want to, if, if, if somebody wanted to donate. Yeah, if you wanted to donate, ashleyshade.com slash donate. Uh, again, your dollars are going to go towards a wonderful campaign. Um, we are, again, as of today, 41% of our fundraising goal. But we 41% is not enough. We've got to hit that full 100% to get all of the things that we need to reach the constituents, to, to have that contingency plan in place in case um, 
in case COVID does not go well. Uh, now, if COVID does go well, those extra resources will still give us the opportunity to make new contacts with the voters. And as they say, you want to make at least seven different contacts with your with your main voters in your community to get them out to vote. Uh, if COVID and door knocking is a thing, we'll use some of those resources to rent a van and bring people to the polls. Hey, you need to vote? Come on, we'll bring you. Um, so those resources will definitely go to use one way or another, um, but we definitely could use help there for sure. So you can donate. If we have five, if we had one hundred five dollar monthly donors, we'd be all set for the entire campaign. Wow, easy peasy. All right, Jordan, what do you got? Uh, well, I guess um, you know, as any uh, uh, libertarian might be curious to, to know, um, you know, oftentimes in public office, certainly, and in races, uh, the role I, I think a lot of times of a libertarian. Um, candidate is to kind of act as the the conscience to the whole process and you know make sure you're there sort of representing um sort of what it is uh you know within the the realm of of uh acceptable and and everything else to to the overall process and um and and likewise just the operation of the government and any potential encroachments that they might be looking to make um and i'm just curious if there's anything on your radar by way of say civil liberty encroachments or um other things uh, you mentioned earlier for instance the the taunting of police officers that hopefully we wouldn't we won't won't see, you know, spread beyond Kentucky and attempting to legislate against that. Um, but I'm just curious if there's anything else on, on your radar that you would want to act as that sort of voice or conscience to, to raise as an issue to everybody, even just during the, the course of, of the, the race. Yeah, I mean, locally, that kind of legislation isn't happening here. Uh, we have a really great community in that case. Uh, actually, uh, I just finished this evening. Um, speaking with members of the North Hutton City Council on a panel where I'm a member of a working group that the city council created for inclusivity, diversity, equity, and access. And so we have that in our community where we are trying to learn and do better and learn more about marginalized communities and the issues mm -hmm. that they face. And our city, our city government is taking that seriously. And I think that's mm -hmm. a great thing. Um, because, you know, we all have our own experiences and perspectives, and we don't think so much about the experiences of, you know, if we pass this law or pass this, how does it affect communities that aren't like yeah. me? We don't think about yeah. that. And we need to. We need to think about how it's going to affect everyone, not just people like us. Um, so, so far in, in, here in our city, I haven't seen anything like that that would alarm me. Um, our, our city is very uh, outspoken against certain things um, that, that are more problematic, but we definitely have a lot of education to go and a lot of, yeah. you know, uh, we don't have a very diverse community. 90% mm. uh, of our community is white. Mm. Uh, so it's, it's not very diverse and there, there's a lot of, learning that needs to still happen within our community but for the most part uh as far as government goes civil liberties have not been encroached upon as much and i'm hoping that will continue um and any attempts to do so uh, would be met very loudly against well, I, I think that's very encouraging to hear you say, and I, I think it's uh, what you also mentioned is is likewise important that even though at first glance right now, you know, we uh, a people of a certain perspective or a certain background background might not see any potential problems or encroachments, but perhaps there are communities that might have grievances that are have never been heard before and um, and have had very real, you know, grievances of encroachment from the government, perhaps, you know, abusive police or something like that. And it's just never gotten out or, you know, and, and I, I, you know, I, I don't want to say anything uh, untoward of the of the community of North Adams. I don't. I'm not familiar with it, so I don't want to imply anything um, otherwise. But uh, I, I definitely think that that's a, a very important thing you bring up, and just the need to engage to look for those things that might not be explicitly brought forward. Yeah. You know, 
So Ashley, we've had, uh, you're, you're speaking to an audience right now that has heard and seen many different campaigns. Chris Spangle, of course, our, our benevolent god of the We Are Libertarians Network is really good about local politics and getting involved locally. And a lot of times it just doesn't work out. People donate their time and money and things like, oh, we really thought something great was going to happen and something really great doesn't end up happening. What makes an Ashley Shade person or campaign so much different or better than what all these other guys were doing? Well, I wouldn't say that it's different or better, but we've got three big things on our side. The first is our messaging. Our messaging is designed to reach people who are not libertarians. It's designed to reach the average voter. Our main messaging strategy and our main message for the campaign is compassion, education, and love. That being compassionate and kind to each other is how we need to discuss the problems in our community. That teaching and listening to each other will help us find the best solutions to those problems. And that coming together as a community to have difficult discussions and still be respectful and kind is so important to the process. So compassion, education, and love is the message that we are using to spread a liberty here in North Adams. And it's working. People are paying attention to that message. It resonates with people. Secondly, I ran for city council four years ago here in North Adams. <clears throat> I had no campaign. I had no team, no budget, no website. I ran a race. This is before I joined the party. I identified as libertarian then, but I wasn't a member of the party. Um, but I ran this. I ran this city council campaign. There were 16 candidates. I finished 14th out of 16th. First time running with no money, no budget. no. I had one sign made up and some buttons made up that I handed out. I participated in a candidate forum and several interviews. Uh, the ninth place winner won with, I believe, 1,650-ish votes. I finished with 700 votes with no campaign. Um, so I need a thousand more votes to win. This time we have a fully launched website. We have a fully launched social media team on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. Our Facebook page already has more likes than any current sitting city councilor. So it's already getting more attention than the people who currently are in office. And not only that, but in that time frame, I've been able to get involved in the local community. I'm on the board of directors of the Berkshire Stonewall Community Coalition, which is the longest serving LGBTQ uh, nonprofit in our region. I've been involved with Berkshire Pride and Berkshire Trans Group and several other organizations. So I'm known as a community leader in activism when it comes to LGBTQ issues. I've also, since that election, I have been a commissioner on the Human Services Commission here in North Adams. So I technically have a place on city government already as a sworn in commissioner. Um, I was recently sworn in again for the second three year term uh, back in February. Uh, and so I am I'm a member of what's going on here. And then last year I was asked to and gratefully accepted a uh, position on the inclusivity, diversity, equity, and access working group that was created to help our city grow in those areas. Currently, we are teaching current city councilors and the mayor about these issues and creating trainings around them. And eventually these trainings will then be created and given as workshops to all city employees that includes the city clerks, the public works, the schools, the fire department, the police. And so it really allows us a chance to educate and help make a difference, hopefully, uh, by providing more information and tools and resources to all the people in our community about how to be better to each other. Um, <clears throat> so being involved has, my name recognition has increased exponentially. Everybody here in North Adams knows who I am. My work in the nonprofits, my work with the activist community, 
I get interviewed a lot by the local papers. They call me and say, hey, can you give your opinion on this? You're one of our leading activists. And so my name is out there in the community and it's well respected in the community because I'm doing work that actually helps people. So by being out in your community, being involved in helping people gives you a really good, strong foundation for running for office. So I got my name out the first time, then I got involved and here I am four years later extremely involved, known as a well-known activist and a respected activist. I only need a thousand more votes. I've already got 40% of my fundraising budget and we haven't even started running the race yet. So are my chances good? I, I, think, I think I have a realistic chance. And the reason why is because we've already been putting in the work for the past few years. You say we, that's a lot of you putting in a lot of work there. <laughs> that's a lot of, yeah, I mean, a lot of the work, you know, the groundwork leading up to it was me, but I have a great team that's helped get the launch going. Um, so I have a team that works with me on my campaign. We are a fully staffed team. We have 30 volunteers. 10 of them are local right here in our community. Democrats, Republicans, independents, volunteering to help get Ashley Shade elected, right? That's amazing, having cross-pollinated different parties. We have, we have, our campaign has basically become a training ground. I have a bunch of people with a lot of experience and a bunch of people that have never worked on a campaign before. And they're coming to my team, they're learning how to do it, and we're building something special. We have a great group of people. My team is the backbone of everything we're doing and having a team makes all the difference. Again, when I ran four years ago, it was all me and I, I didn't know what the heck I was doing. I didn't know, I didn't have anybody to really lean on to help. And four years later, I've now worked on 10 different political campaigns myself, from local to congressional, to Senate, to presidential, to governor's races. I've worked on them all and I've gotten the experience and made the connections. Um, but the important thing is I have a great team behind me and the team believes in the message and believes in the candidate. And that makes all the difference. They're excited, they wanna do it. And we are going to do something special here in North Adams. So I, uh, maybe to um, give a little bit of uh, uh, economic uh, throwback here. So a Adam Smith um, in the uh, the Wealth of Nations into the inquiry and cause and of the Wealth of Nations, uh, he he said that you know the crux of that was the reason why rich countries are rich is division of labor, um, and you know the ability to actually divvy up tasks and you know assemble you know be able to uh, not everybody having to make all of their own stuff. So it sounds like you know. That the, having a team is a bit of a realization of that. Um, I'm curious if you could maybe tell our audience a little bit um, what are some of the those tasks that your team has taken on? Like, what does the delegation structure look like, perhaps? And like, what are some of those things that your team is doing for you that's helping to amplify your reach that perhaps you didn't have four years ago? Yeah, absolutely. So we are structured. I have a campaign manager. I have a digital communications manager. Uh, the digital communications handles everything, social media, website, graphic designs for uh, all of that, um, videos that I end up doing in interviews, it's all under graphics communication. We have a data, data analytics person who is breaking down voter registration data, uh, voter information, so we know what issues are important to people, where the voters are. Uh, and we have the demographics on the voters of North Adams. I have a communications director who is doing all the press releases and media type stuff. Uh, and then we have deputy directors under there too. So on our digital communications team, we have two deputy directors. One does content, one does managing of the social media. We have somebody specific that's working at the website stuff. We have specific members of the team doing the graphics for us, making all the graphics that we use to promote different things. Um, doing that kind of stuff is stuff that I would have never been able to do on my own before. I didn't have a graphics team before. Uh, I'm not very good with graphics. It's great that I have somebody that can do that. Um, I've done web web stuff in the past. I'm not very good at making a new website. I, I can edit it fairly easily, but making one, I'm not so good on design. 
So we got somebody to design us a website, and it's beautiful, and it's great, and it's very functional, uh, and it's very me. Uh, so we have those things in place. And then we have a lot of young people who have gotten involved and said, hey, I want to learn more about how to do this on social media, or I want to I wanna learn more about policy. We have a policy team. Our policy mm -hmm. team has a deputy director as well. So we've got two leaders, you know, and we're training new people to be leaders at the same time. So our, our current, you know, directors have experience, but our deputy directors, some of them don't have the experience, but they're learning how to do it. And uh, they're in a position to help lead other people because they're excited and they're willing to do the work and they have somebody to help guide them along. Uh, which is kind of giving back and making sure that, you know, we get the next group of people ready to go as well. And I think that's just as important when we're running campaigns is to help train new people. Um, so we, we have all of that in place. We have a great team, a great staff. Uh, we are organized and, and organizing is very important to me. I like organization. Um, and our volunteers know what to do. As we start getting into it, we're going to have a field director and we're going to have our ground team. And those are going to be a lot of my local volunteers who are going to be out here on the ground helping me get the word out, making me collect signatures for the ballot, uh, helping us pass out literature, doing doing sign standouts, uh, all of those things that we would do locally. So we have all of those things in place and we'll be building more. Uh, we'll be building out, you know, with our field ops, we're also going to be building coal people for calling, um, people to call, you know, call voters, tax voters, all of the phone banking. Uh, so that'll be another section that'll go into there. And we'll have another director for that. And we'll train people and we'll bring in new volunteers and we'll show them how to do it. Um, and that's, that's the goal. And the goal is also to spread out the work so three people aren't doing all of the work themselves. One thing that we as libertarians do is take on everything. I have like 18 jobs it's insane um or i did I, I dropped a few and then added two new ones i don't know why uh, i'm insane <laughs> <laughs> but one thing that we do is take on everything if we have the ability to delegate things out and have more people involved get somebody else a chance to learn how to do something and you get to spread out the work so it's not overwhelming and that also helps keep people engaged and wanting to be a part of it we have something for everybody to do who comes on and we have a way to spread out the work so it's not overtaxing one individual too much. Awesome. Well, we've talked uh, so much about your local race, but I mean, let's just, let's just get to know you a little bit better. Let's open things up a little bit because uh, I think everybody's going to have your website and, and how to visit you and, and how to contact you and how to, how to support you. We'll put that in the, the show notes, I'll be sure that that is included in there. So if you're listening, that's where you can check all that out. Um, let me start with something. Uh, you are not shy about being a transgender individual, um, member of the GSM community. You've <laughs> had not only been a member of the community, you've been a leader in the community for a very long time. You talk about these things like such an advantage when I think most people view them as such a I mean, you've spoken about it very positively. I, I, I guess maybe advantage isn't the right word, but you've talked about these opportunities that you've taken up. And I think a lot of people see this as kind of a, a big disadvantage. How do you stay optimistic? You know, because I, I know, and if you would like to share, but I know that you get pushback for who you are. Yeah, I mean, of course I get pushback for who I am. Uh, and that's something that I have to deal with in my life. Uh, how do I stay optimistic? I don't always. I don't always stay optimistic, but I do try to respond to people optimistically. Uh, you know, when somebody makes an ignorant comment, I see it as an educational opportunity. A lot of the ignorances that is out there is because of misinformation or not understanding. That's the majority of it. Some of it is pure hatred and, and, and arrogance and, and, you know, with hatred, it's really difficult sometimes but it's still an educational opportunity. If I can put out a message, yeah. let's let's say, Hody, I know you wouldn't, but you said some kind of transphobic comment about me uh, because, because I'm trans and you're like, well, trans people who shouldn't do this. And it gives me an opportunity to say, hey, you know what? Actually, here's some information about what it's really like being trans. Here's some information about this particular topic. 
And likely, if you're saying something negative to start with, you're probably going to say, well, you're still trans, screw you, whatever. However, somebody else who might be reading along in those comments might see that I posted something that helps them understand better. And hopefully that reaches them and they're like, oh, well, I didn't know that about trans people. Now I have a better understanding and hopefully that teaches them to be kinder and more, more understanding. So it's really important that we take the opportunity to educate people. And it's also extremely important not to tolerate people who are abusive. When they get into that territory where it's abusive, it, it, people have to stand up. People have to, um, you know, I try to stand up when I can, but when the abuse gets, it can get overwhelming. We need our allies to stand up with us and say, no, this is too far. You can't do this. You can't can't do this um so you know it's education is a big part of what i do and i like to think that because i've been an educator that more people are understanding of trans issues especially in the libertarian movement than would have otherwise ever know um I, I think it's fair to say that i've had a positive influence in that direction and I want to continue to have that positive influence and teach people. Um, but also at the same time, when people become abusive and it becomes extremely clear that it's just pure malice or hatred, those types of things need to be called out and those types of things shouldn't be acceptable. And so again, it's, it's that balance of ignorance versus malice and the intent and is this something that we can need to turn into an educational teaching opportunity? If so, let's do it, great. If not, I tend to walk away from those situations and let other people jump in. And it's good to have allies who do jump in um, because it's really difficult to take a bunch of abuse and always be expected to defend yourself against it. And it doesn't matter what you're defending yourself against. Um, we as human beings can only be attacked for so long before we lash out. Um, you can only put us in a corner for so long before we uh, lash out. Uh, and I've been relatively good about not lashing out, although sometimes I have, and I will admit that. And I try to do better when that happens. Uh, I try to remove myself from certain situations or not respond for a while to certain things uh, and then come back to it later when my mind has had a chance to slow down. But education is the key. Compassion, education, and love right? We have to be kinder to each other. So you can hate me, you can be mean to me. That doesn't mean I have to hate you or be mean to you. And I don't want to hate anybody. I don't hate people. I hate behaviors. I hate actions. I don't hate people, right? Um, so I understand that difference. And then I'm always willing to have a, an actual conversation with anybody who's willing to actually have a genuine conversation. Sweet. Jordan, what do you got? Um, well, I think um, I'm curious to, to hear a little bit more about your experience along those lines as, as a transgender woman. I, I personally live in the Midwest um, mm -hmm. and I grew up in um, Northern Indiana. I currently reside in, in South Michigan. In, in th this region, I feel like I've seen mindsets come a long way just in the past, you know, a uh, couple of decades that I've been alive. And, and uh, it seems like um, there's a lot more acceptance, a lot more um, folks that feel um, uh, able to fully express themselves. Um, and, um, you know, they can and go through transitions, whereas I feel like perhaps there, there may not have been as much of an acceptance. I'm just curious what your experience has been along those lines in terms of, um, you know, do you feel like where you are geographically in the country helps the acceptance um, versus if you were, say, in the South somewhere? <laughs> or, um, you know, what what, what is what has your experience been like in that regard? Yeah, I would say that it definitely helps where I am geographically uh, up here in Massachusetts. Things are a lot more accepting. Uh, sure. And we have, you know, uh, laws in place that you know, protect me from people doing terrible things. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a little less stress on that. Um, 
basically the laws say that I am a human being that has the same rights as everybody else and you can't treat me differently. <laughs> so um, that's important uh, when it comes down to marginalized communities. Laws aren't the only solution and they shouldn't be, but when harm is done so egregiously, sometimes you need them, if not temporarily. Um, <clears throat> here in Massachusetts, things are accepting. I grew up in this community where I live now, North Adams. I went to school here, elementary school, middle school, high school. I went to college here. I moved away for a year and then I came back. And then I came out. So for me, a lot of people don't do that. A lot of people who transition, they get away from everything and everyone they knew. They start over. I was the exact opposite. I came out here where I was home. That was really difficult and scary for me. I'll be honest, the day I came out, um, I was working in a pharmacy. I worked at CVS Pharmacy. And uh, that's a very public, open job. Work directly with customers. It's very public. Everybody in the city goes there for their pills and their prescriptions. And so, especially the older community. And so here I am in one of the most public facing jobs you could have. And one day I walk in and I say, hi, I'm Ashley. And, you know, I changed my appearance a little to when I when I did come out the, the day before I got my hair done and changed the style and the help, you know, to present myself more feminine. But it was the scariest day of my life. I was so afraid that I live about mm, four tenths of a mile from that location where I worked. So I walked there. In the time it took me to walk there, I threw up twice. That's how afraid I was. I was actually afraid. I walked into work. The reception was friendly. My coworkers knew about it going in. So, and I had a, an opening shift, first thing in the morning where it wasn't really busy. So it gave me a chance to get a groove in. But I thought it got busy. You know, there were a lot of kind comments that I wasn't expecting. But there were also those people who were, you know, they give you those looks. Now, nobody said anything directly to me uh, because I'm six foot two and I used to be a semi-professional football player. And I can literally still beat most people up if I wanted to. I don't want to, but I could. Um, <laughs> so, you know, nobody, nobody, I, I never had the fear of like physically being threatened. Um Although I, I, I have been, um, I've received death threats. The last time I ran for office, somebody put an anonymous letter in my mailbox. That was pretty messed up. It was typed, no name, of course, coward. Never found out who it was. I wish it did because I'd love to have a conversation with that person. But, um, yeah, it, it's, it's definitely... Um, the reason I do this work is because nobody should have to live in fear. Nobody should. I spent most of my life being so afraid to be who I was. I knew who I was years and years ago when I was a teenager before. I knew when I was a little, when I was a little child. And I was so afraid to be myself. I was so afraid to express who I was. And I'm lucky. I survived. I, I should not be alive today. I, I survived. Um, and it came down to a life or death decision. Either I'm going to be who I am and stop repressing and hiding who I am, or I can't live here anymore. And I survived. And when I survived, I said, okay, well, I guess I get to live. And so here we go. And I did it. And here I am. You know, uh, I, I came out and I came out on September 3rd, 2014. So uh, here I am almost seven years later. Um, I've become a respected member of my community. Uh, and I've become a, I'd like to think, respected member of the Libertarian Party and community. Um, maybe not by everybody, but by a lot of people, I think. And it's because, you know, when I came out and finally got a chance to be myself, you know, the, the idea of my campaign, compassion, education, and love, that sums up who I am as a person. When I talk about those things, you know it's real because I genuinely believe it. 
it's something that's a part of me. Um, and I believe that's how we can help other people and live in a better society where everybody can be freer, where everybody can have liberty. And uh, yeah, I hope that answered the question. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, as far as personal brands go, that's pretty awesome to have as as love, compassion, you know, and and I, I really have a lot of respect for that as being sort of your 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 go to central platform, and um, and uh, so yeah, I, I really look forward to seeing how you fare, and and uh, I'm I'm really uh, hoping that a lot of folks will see and resonate with that message. I think one of the things that I was curious to ask you about um, with uh, you know coming out. Well, hopefully, cross the knock on wood, coming out of the pandemic, um, you know, as we as we move forward, um, you had mentioned um, mental health and and you yes. know the potential move to things like telehealth and things like that. Um, oftentimes, um, you know, community health uh, isn't necessarily you know at the forefront of technological advances and and things like that. I, I'm curious, um, what is the state of community health in North Adams and um, you know, where do you see uh, potential opportunities or do you see, um, you know, any any problems that are, are glaring that need to be uh, addressed rather urgently? Um, just curious for your take on that. Yeah, uh, most of the, all, all of the pri providers here are, are private providers for healthcare. Okay. Um, okay. North Adams itself had a hospital that closed down in 2014. A full mm. hospital been here over 100 years, it closed. Currently, the services that were revived were an emergency room um, and imaging services, but there's no inpatient services up here at our hospital. Uh, so now we have to go a half an hour away to get to the nearest hospital for hmm. any kind of inpatient services or extreme emergency services. Um, so that, that's definitely an issue. The access of healthcare is an issue. Um, in North Adams, we are very secluded from the rest of the state. We're in a valley, we're surrounded by mountains. Uh, it takes 45 minutes to get over the mountain and get to Greenfield, which is the closest thing on the other side of the mountain that connects you anywhere else in the state. Um, so we have problems with that. We don't have enough providers for healthcare services in, in our county. Um, so there's a real shortage there. Well, I think one of the things we can focus on as, as a community or even as a in, in a local government is that we can work and we can work with providers in the state of Massachusetts and say, hey, we have a growing group of people here who need access to mental health services. We have great infrastructure for, uh, you know, we have fiber running through the city. So we have the ability to, you know, we have the ability to provide and make sure that our network is secure and, and ready for to go. Um, and because of those transportation issues that we've actually shown from our providers here, uh, missed appointments have gone down 25% since COVID. People are actually going to appointments more often because they can hmm. actually get to them because of the telehealth. Um, they don't have to get out. They don't have to try to find a cab or take a bus for two hours to get to another part of the county to go to a doctor. Um, so it makes it a lot easier. And I think we need to partner with all of the providers in the area and make sure the telehealth services remain available and remain an option going forward uh, and, and work to bring, you know, if we can't have the providers in other areas physically here, find new providers that'll work with, with our area in providing telehealth services. Tell me a little bit about your Liberty journey. I know you had, like you said, you had kind of even registered as a libertarian. Well, I guess you claimed you're a libertarian before you registered or how did you, how did you get to that point? Yeah. So uh, I got politically involved back in college. Um, I want to say 2006, probably. I joined the political science club, um, you know, started learning about politics. Uh, by my last two years of college, I was running the political science club. So I was, I was the president at that point of the political science club my last two years. Um, going from my, I, I was in school for five years. So going from my third to fourth year, uh, going into our fourth year, we started with four members. By the end of my fourth year, going into my fifth, we had 45 members. Uh, we got the club active. We did a lot of stuff. 
and we tried one of my, one of the things that I was always big about as the political science club director was that our events had to have some neutrality and that if we were uh, talking about a position such as marijuana legalization or whatever it was that we were doing that we presented people or information on both sides of the equation and did not want it to be slanted so if we were talking about taxes, we'd have somebody for or against. If we were talking about, uh, you know, gay marriage, we'd have somebody for or against. It was, it was important to make sure that all perspectives had an opportunity to be heard. Um, as I came out of college, uh, in college, I was kind of seen as, of, as a token conservative type. I was an economic conservative and a social moderate is what I described myself as. Uh, I didn't. I never felt comfortable in the Republican Party, and so I never really joined the Republican Party. Um, but I tended to vote more with Republican candidates at that time. Uh, by 2016, I had found Gary Johnson, and I was a, a big fan of his campaign that year. I voted for Gary Johnson in 2016. Uh, and that's when I found that, you know, I think I identify as libertarian. I think the Libertarian Party has a lot of views that I understand and agree with, you know. I love this, uh, the non-aggression principle. I love, you know, the, the right to self-autonomy. As a trans woman, that really appealed to me, that, that nobody should interfere in my rights to be who I am. I should be able to live my life how I choose so long as I'm not hurting anybody. That really resonated with me. Uh, the old slogan, keep your government out of my out of, out of my wallet and out of my bedroom. Uh, I like both of those things. I don't want government in either of them. Uh, so that made me, you know, really happy and understanding. Um, but I also knew that transgender people at that time weren't really welcomed in the Libertarian Party. They weren't really, uh, there was a lot of negativity about transgender people. And at that time, I wasn't ready to jump in. Uh, but it was around mid-2018, uh, June of 2018, I reached out on social media to Nicholas Sarwar, then chair of the Libertarian Party. And I sent his account a message and I said, hey, my name is Ashley. I consider myself libertarian. I'm a registered libertarian voter. I voted for Gary Johnson, but I've not taken the time to get involved in the party. And here's you know, some of the reasons why. I'd like to know if you think that transgender people have a place in the party, if they belong here, and if so, would you be willing to put out a statement saying so? Less than five minutes later, I got a response. And I was really surprised. The chair of a, a political party is messaging some, some random person? He responded, absolutely transgender people belong, and immediately made a post about it. Uh, when he did that, I said, you know, if you, you make a public post, I will immediately join the party today. He made the public post. I joined the national party. I joined the state party. And uh, I've been a part of the libertarian movement ever since. So uh, that's that's what really got me kicked off. I got introduced to some folks at Mass LP. I got introduced to Jan Fishman, who was running for auditor then. And I got introduced to uh, Trisha Lynch, who was doing policy work for Larry Sharp. And that was the first campaign I ever worked for. It was Larry Sharp's uh, governor campaign back in 2018. So that's how I got involved. Yeah. You and me together. <laughs> I, I remember that. I didn't know it was your first campaign, but awesome. Yeah, yeah that was my first, first campaign. Jordan, what do you got? Um, so, yeah, I, I guess at the risk of getting into um, party politics a little bit, and, and given that I'm here um, representing the, the left libertarian voice, uh, I guess one one question I'm curious to ask you about, um, you know, I admittedly don't necessarily identify as part of any, um, you know, uh, uh, marginalized group or anything. So I, I can't firsthand feel the any kind of, um, you know, exclusion or, or, or anything like that. And I know that um, there's kind of a debate going on amongst various factions of, of the Libertarian Party as to um, whether or not it you know, and, and kind of the two straw mans on either side of, of or either extreme are either, um, you know, we can't 
uh, go after the paleo conservative audience because too many of them are bigots. And if we bring, bring in bigots, then we alienate the people who they're bigoted against, you know, and then the flip side is, oh, you know, um, we can't be too crazy gatekeepers. We need to bring in people. We need to give them a chance. We need to. And, and you know, certainly, the, obviously, the answer is somewhere in between. There's, you know, I, I tend to believe that, um, you know, people need, deserve a chance and they deserve an opportunity to evolve. But then at the same time, if somebody is inherently toxic or is inherently, you know, just combative at all times and is, you know, n not really showing any clear indication of turning around, then there should be some mechanism for disassociation. And, and I'm I'm just kind of curious to see or, or to, to hear from you what the reality of that has been in your experience. I mean, you just spoke very clearly that that was extremely important and, and you know, the litmus test almost for whether or not you were going to join the party. Um, what's it like for somebody that does identify as a part of one of those groups who then sees these people who want to open up these floodgates of folks who, you know, want to come in and, you know, and be unabashed bigots. And, and maybe one example I'll just give, um, and, and this might, you know, rile some feathers, but I, I keep hearing about the takeover of the LP New Hampshire uh, group and uh, specifically their Facebook group, um, which had to be remade because they they effectively wanted to add rules into it, making it what I would call a safe space for bigots, where they basically said, one of our rules is you're not allowed to call somebody out for bigotry. Um, and so it kind of made it, uh, you know, one of those places that seems like it would be rather alienating to uh, somebody who, you know, uh, identifies as, as part of a, a marginalized group. So I, I'm curious to get your take on what you've seen. Obviously, things differ from, say, LP National to various state organizations and things like that. Um, but I'm, I'm curious to get your take on that and sort of where you you think maybe that that happy medium exists, you know, if it does, and, and what it might look like to you? <laughs> I know it's a loaded question. It's a loaded question. You're putting me on the spot here. All right. Here's, here's the deal. If you have a history of being a terrible person, and you cannot recognize that you were terrible or apologize for it, then I don't want you here. If you are willing to say, I was terrible, I said horrible things in the past, I'm sorry for that, I'd like to learn how to do better. I'll welcome you with open arms. I'll even teach you myself how to be better. It's that simple. It's about intent. It's about willingness to understand. Our party platform says bigotry is repugnant and irrational, does not have a place in society. Either you're on board with that or you're not. If you're not on board with that and you continue to double down against it, we have a problem. That that is a big, big problem. You can't you can't have that. Now, there's also an extreme where people will be called bigoted and they don't understand why they're being bigoted. Mm -hmm. And those are those educational opportunities that we're talking about. Now, if I can give somebody information as to why that might be offensive and they say, oh, well, I, I didn't intend for it to be offensive, I'm sorry. That's all we're asking for, right? Opportunity to learn and do better. But when you double down on those statements to purposefully be offensive, and not care that you're being offensive, not only does it hurt our messaging and a brand, but it actually causes harm to people. So don't hurt people, don't take their stuff. That includes language. Language can hurt people. Language can be aggression. When you use language to advocate for laws that affect a certain type of community, that is a form of aggression. When you use your own language to say that somebody should not be able to live their lives how they choose when they're not hurting others, that is aggression, right? So we, we have to understand that we are not supposed to be intentionally trying to hurt other people, even the people that we don't agree with. There should never be any intent to hurt people. 
whether that's with words or actions. And that intent matters. That willingness to be able to say I was wrong is something libertarians need to get better at, all of us. Admit when you do something wrong. It's okay to be wrong. Let me repeat that. It is okay to be wrong. We are not right all the time. We are not correct all the time. And when we present ourselves to voters and say, I'm correct, you're an idiot, this is how it's supposed to be. Guess who's not voting for you or anybody else who's a libertarian? Any of them. But when you say, hey, I understand what you're saying. I, I get your point. But guess what? I have this other idea here that I'd love to tell you about because I think it can help solve your problem. When we approach it that way, instead of saying you're wrong, you're an idiot, well, have you thought about it like this? Here's another solution that could potentially work for your problem. And this one has liberty. Yay! They're going to be a lot more receptive to that message than you saying you're wrong and you're an idiot. Yeah. So the hard line for me is if, if somebody is not remorseful and they are actively and purposefully with intent trying to be horrible and bigoted and racist towards other people, they don't have a place here. They shouldn't have a place here. It's not okay. If they are ignorant and they say something stupid and they're willing to atone for it, apologize, and not do it again? Everybody deserves an extra chance, right? So it's really about it's really about that intent. It's really about are do they really want to improve and get better? Do they really want to learn or are they just trying to be assholes? And if you're just going to be an asshole, I I I I don't have time for assholes. I got work to do. I'm spreading liberty. I'm trying to win an election. I ain't got time for it. I'm sorry. You barely have time for sleep. You certainly don't have time for that. Well, uh, so <laughs> Brian just messaged me. Unfortunately, it looks like work's going to keep him, so he's going to miss this. So I get to be your pretend right-winger for a second here. So uh, I love this. Let me throw this your way then. Um, what's so wrong then with just why can't I just not see race, not see gender? Why can't I just treat everybody the same? Why is it so important that I say nice things about transgender people and transgender athletes and say nice thing and like try to support black businesses. Isn't that just reverse racism, like liking them or, you know, reverse sexism or just liking them because why can't I just value them as people? Look, it's great to value people as people. It's also important to understand that there are certain groups of people who have been disproportionately harmed by our system, by our system of government, by our society and that there are people actively trying to harm them just because they're different. And that's not okay. And so I would love for everybody to say me as just a human being and treat me with dignity and respect as if they would any other human being. But I also need to rec them to recognize that because I'm different, there are people in governments and systems trying to make my life more difficult. They're trying to actively cause me harm. We have to be aware of what's happening around us. Just because somebody's not causing you harm doesn't mean they're not causing harm to others. And if a libertarian society is going to work, if we're going to have freedom without government or very little minimal government, we in the society have to stand up against people causing others harm. We have to be willing to do that. If we're not willing to do that, how is how is the system ever going to succeed? It's not. It'll collapse. So it's really I think you important. bring up an important point, which is to, to keep a focus on the disproportionate impact of government on some of these these uh, marginalized groups. I think that's a yeah. you bring up an amazing way. I think to build a bridge to a lot of libertarians because I brought this up uh, a couple of episodes ago when we talked about 
Steven Crowder's ridiculous outrage over black farmers complaining that they were getting discriminated against um, and uh, by the USDA. And he put on a, uh, a black accent and did some really terrible you know, things and said some terrible things. But it, at the end of the day, my takeaway from that is, wait a minute, somebody said that they were discriminated against by the government and your first instinct was to take the government side? Like, it doesn't make any sense to me. Like, if, if you really are, are, you know, uh, purporting to be advocating for, for liberty. So um, I think that, I think you bring up a really good point, which is to really keep a lot of these dis discussions focused on just how badly and like give concrete evidence of just how badly the government has exploited, you know, these mechanisms to abuse these marginalized communities throughout history. Yeah. Yeah. Governments like to oppress people. Governments feed off of oppression and separation. And how do they do that? They go after the marginalized communities, the yep. smallest groups of different people, and they turn everybody against them because, hey, they're not infringing on my rights. So, you know, it's only that group over there. Let's, let's just get them, right? Because they're different, so it's okay. No, it should never be okay. Liberty is for everybody. And I'll, and I'll give you an example here that... Um, hopefully will resonate with somebody. Um, as libertarians, we're all pro Second Amendment. I've never heard a libertarian who's against the idea of owning weapons for self-defense, right? I'm, I'm, a, yeah. I'm a two-way girl. I believe in being able to protect myself with any tool that I deem necessary to, present, to protect my life, especially as a marginalized person, especially as somebody who could be in danger in certain parts of this country. I should absolutely be able to use whatever tool I deem necessary, right? So no argument there. When somebody, when some, when a shooting happens, like just happened in Colorado, and they start bringing up gun control legislation, well, and their excuse is, well, we have to take guns away from people because there was a mass shooting. And when we argue against it, we say, well, there's already laws on the books for people who murder, for people who do terrible things. Why are you punishing people who haven't committed a crime? Why are you making it more difficult for people who've never committed a crime? I want to ask that same question when a legislature tries to put in place a bill that says I can't use a public restroom. As a transgender person, saying that I'm a predator when, one, that never happens, you can look it up, it, it's very, very rare. And two, we already have laws on the books for people who do abusive things. If somebody's going to be a predator and be abusive, they deserve to be thrown in jail. It shouldn't matter if they're trans or not. So why would you put a law in place that is taking away my right to use a public restroom, why are you attacking me when I haven't actually committed a crime or done anything wrong? It's the same principle being used by two different sides of the political spectrum. Stop hurting people who haven't done anything wrong. Stop trying to restrict their rights just because you think a group of people are going to harm others. We already have laws that take care of the act. So, you know, and, and if you're for liberty, then you should be able to agree with that statement on both ends of it. The discrimination aspect is always, especially when we're dealing with like public property, it's like, why all of a sudden would we say, uh, no, you guys, you know, and treat everybody the same unless it's public property, in which case then we require these people to do that. Whereas you'd think that'd be flipped around, right? Like public property is the one thing where they can't you know, mess with your rights and private property is the one where they can. That being said, there has always been like a difficult balance, um, especially with the Libertarian Party, where we condemn bigotry as irrational and repugnant, which is fantastic. And then at the same time, we'll have to, you know, see people stand up for people that don't want to bake the cake, uh, people that don't want to serve a transgender, homosexual I mean, even don't want to serve a black person and say, hey, that's their property. They can do what they want. Where, where do you, what are your kind of feelings on how you navigate that? All right. Two things. I'm going to take this in two separate directions. First, I want to address the cake. Okay. If you own a cake shop 
and somebody asks you to make a custom piece and you decide that you don't want to make a custom piece, I'm okay with that. As the artist, you should be able to customize the pieces and do the work that you're willing to do. Now, if somebody walks in who is black, gay, or straight, and you say, I'm not going to do any kind of service with you whatsoever, you can't buy something from me, that is blatant discrimination. It is against, you know, the, the Civil Rights Act, and it is a problem. There's a difference between not wanting to create something specific and not being willing to serve someone. If you are a public business, meaning you are, you, you may have your own private business, but if you are open and serve the public, that means you are open to and serve everybody. If you are a private closed entity that does not serve the public, that is completely different, like a private club. That is a different thing than being a public business. If you are a public business, if you are open to the public, then you shouldn't be allowed to discriminate because you're open to the public. It's as simple as yeah, that. I think I think one good th uh, I recommended this series um, uh, on the last episode, but there's a really good series right now on Netflix uh, that just came out. Um, it's actually hosted by Will Smith. It's called Amend the Fight for America, and it's uh, um, all about the 14th Amendment. And it's all about basically how the 14th Amendment has been the crux of um, uh, helping to, um, you know, bring bring safety to marginalized groups and and different groups and and really the 14th amendment has been the vehicle through which the the bill of rights you know the first 10 amendments have been realized by all of these marginalized communities and and i think you know in much the same way that you, we might say why are we looking to legislate this stuff? Like we we already have, um, you know, some some of this stuff on the on the books in terms of um, you know predators and and things like that. I think on the flip side, some people might make the argument to say, well, you know, hey, we we don't really need this. We already have the amendments and and whatnot. And I think the reality that some people need to realize though is just how unequally those were actually enforced and upheld, you know, throughout our country historically. And um, that, you know, the Civil Rights Act was kind of necessary and probably still is to make sure that those rights were, you know, and, and um, you brought up uh, Gary Johnson and I, I was just reading some people today on Facebook reflecting back that like, supposedly he lost a lot of people because he said, Hey, I don't think we're as a country probably just ready just yet to repeal the civil rights act. I think we still need some of that. And like, we can't just rely on people to do it themselves just yet. Um, and, and I think, I think that, that's kind of what I'm hearing you say here too, is that, you know, ideal world, yes, everybody would do this in their own right, but we already have some pretty great amendments. We have some pretty good bill of rights. Let's make sure that everybody gets to enjoy those. And that's really kind of all we're asking and making sure that, you know, those folks get the equal protection that I, you know, theoretically they deserve like anybody else would. Yeah, and when it comes to the Constitution, the Constitution is a document that is supposed to be a rules for the government, right? The Constitution is supposed to be the government's rule book. These are the rules that you have to apply by as a, go as a government. The Constitution says all men are created equal. It does not say women. It does not say black people. As a matter of fact, it counts black people as three-fifths of a person. Uh, so we need to update our language, right? We, we need to update that language. There should be language that says all people are created equal in our Constitution. It should be updated. So many people are against updating the Constitution. No, oh, it's it's a document. It's, it's, it's this... Living, do it's this document that can never be changed. It's this document that's set in stone. What the, the Constitution is, and here's the problem we have, and this is why we have all these crazy laws, the Constitution is a tool. And as a tool, eventually you have to sharpen it. You get upgrades for your tools. You, have, you got a rifle, you might get some brand new ammunition, you might get a new scope. You might get a new trigger. You got to update and clean and take care of your tools so that they can be best used to prevent government interference. 
And in this case, we need to update the Constitution to make sure that it protects everybody and sees everybody as equal human beings. We don't have that currently. And that's why all these laws are put in place. Even the 14th Amendment didn't do enough of that. Yeah. We need language that says all people are created equal. All people should be treated equal under the law and by government. Government should never, ever be allowed to discriminate against a group of individuals, a group of people. Okay. Never. Government's obligation is to represent the people, all of the people. Not just the ones that are like them, not just the ones they like. If you are an elected official, you represent everybody, whether they voted for you or not. And so you should not be able to discriminate against a group of people you represent. It's that simple. So we need to get over this notion that the Constitution should never be changed. It needs to be changed. We need to update our tools. Because if we can update the Constitution, we can fight back against tyranny in the government. We can fight back against ridiculous laws. I hate to break it to people, but laws were not supposed to be easy to pass. That, that was the whole point. We weren't supposed to have two parties going back and forth and working with each other to screw everybody over. We should have a bunch of smaller parties who represent certain interests, and when they finally do find common ground, a law gets passed. But we shouldn't have the laws passed every day. It should be very, very difficult to pass new laws. Yeah. So it, I mean, It's interesting what you said about the, um, the language of the Constitution. Another one of the things from the series that I, I didn't know previously was that when the Equal Rights Amendment was being pushed for ratification in the early 80s, it came just three states shy of getting ratified. I didn't realize it was that yes. close. And like, you know, the, the religious right pushed hard enough to get get it to stop there. But that kind of blew my mind. I didn't realize that it was it was that close uh, to getting that that amendment passed. Yeah, and it should be passed. And, you know, at this yeah. point, it has all the signatures. It just expired in time. Mm. So. If Congress wanted to, they could go back and renew it, and we would have an Equal Rights Act. And there should mm -hmm. be. We have to update the language as things go on. We should have equal rights for all human beings in society, all so, people of the United States. I'm going to put on my Captain Anarchist pants real quick. Mm -hmm. um, so the uh, Constitution, for every time it's been amended uh, to increase one person's rights we've had three additional amendments to decrease other people's rights to make exceptions for why you can't have the rights that you have what um what process i guess would you suggest that we go through to make sure that what you're saying which i'm in support of you know things that create more equality get in and things that don't stay at the side because right now i just i i have a tough time trusting our elected officials to do a good thing instead of a bad thing if I give them the tools to amend the Constitution. Well, the constitutional amendment requires 38 states to sign off on it. It's a lot much, it's a much more difficult process. It requires, it requires a majority in both houses. It requires the president and then it requires, it requires 38 states to ratify it. So it's, it's already a very, very difficult thing. And when we say equal rights, we're not talking about taking rights away from anybody else. We're saying that everybody should be treated equally under the law and by government. We're saying that everybody in society is a human being and should be treated as such, regardless of our differences in gender, race, religion, age, whatever that may be. Uh, it's about just ensuring and saying loudly and proudly that all human beings have these unalienable rights. All the human beings are protected by the Constitution and that the Constitution applies to governments from causing harm to any human being rather than just, as originally framed, white landowners. Because that's, that's what the Constitution was originally for. Sure. So, well, I'm sure. I'm sure you see my exception. Is uh, I'm having a problem with this because as a right, uh, as a white landowner, I've had a real tough time <laughs> with the way some of these amendments have gone. But no, I mean, which, this, which this amendment? Like, which amendment? <laughs> no, I'm just. I, 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 I'm making a joke. 
I have a problem with this. I don't anybody think for about income tax, but you know, yes. that's a different story. 16 is terrible. <laughs> but what amendment has given someone else rights where it's taken away from others? Can, can you actually tell me what amendment? Um, I, mean, um, so I would got... say the one that lets Congress raise their uh, uh, wages that they just passed, like after 200 years or something, not, not too long ago. That one is that they're taking away our ability to keep their pay low. But uh... <laughs> so that, that's that's a problem. But I believe they said that it, it can't be passed during the current session. It would have to be yes, done. That's right. Yeah. So it would apply to the it would apply to future people, not the right. Ones in office. Right. <laughs> Um, and I believe that before that, they could actually give themselves raises while they were in session. I th you might be right, actually. But yeah, I, I think that so it actually yeah. made it more restrictive for them. Yeah, they I think you're right. Raises, they gave the next, they could give the next people raises. Um, I think, I think it's more restrictive is a good thing, but it didn't go far enough to to curb. Yeah. Yeah. Most of them get very sure. locked in. But, but other than that, which one actually gave somebody else rights that took away from somebody else? I mean, you have certain things like the Commerce Clause, right? Where, you know, that's government. The that's the, well, I guess that's the Constitution. So you specifically I'm just want an I'm, I'm asking, you said, you said there were amendments that were put in place that gave other people rights that took away from others. What amendment has done that? Now, what I said specifically is there's amendments that have restricted people's rights. I'm not saying they're giving them to other people, except for potentially giving them to government, I guess. But like, okay. like uh, I, I mean, it, so what's funny yeah, is government. I was going to bring up the the clause in what is it, the Thirteenth Amendment, that basically lets pe the government re-enslave people if they've committed a crime, right? Uh, which okay, kind of you know example. creates. And I yep. think uh, section um, five. Other than that, yeah, section five of fourteen is actually it's funny because fourteen is great, and then they add little section five in there, which is like, oh, and the government gets to, to decide who counts as an immigrant and who doesn't. And then you're like, oh, no. okay, like we're doing so good, guys, and then you know, like you know, well, we don't want to give away all our power now. We we got to hold something, <laughs> something, something in our hand now. Uh, I just, you know, I think for me, I just have a tough time trusting, especially the uh, current iteration of Congress people that we have. I, whenever I hear them saying like, you know, most of the time they'll abuse the judicial system, of course, to get exceptions to many of these amendments that, that are for our protection. I mean, heck, amendments one through 10, right? Bill of Rights and all the time they're like, well, protection from unreasonable search and seizure unless... You know, you got drugs or something yeah. like that. You and know, then, something. And, then we don't, and we we are responsible for enforcing this, and we haven't, and that's part of the problem. Yeah, so right. I mean, it's... responsible for enforcing those. The states have failed, and the people are responsible for enforcing those. Yeah, there's a. I mean, it, it, it's a complicated thing, and I, I I I say this just for the sake of friendly debate. I mean, these are. Minouche, and ultimately you're running for city council, and these are just fun discussions that we like to have as libertarians, you know, uh, to have to have back and forth. But they are uh, a, a debate of luxury, I guess I would call it. But uh, yeah, I always have fun. I think for me, I always see I, I, I am still at, even as an anarchist, I'm still very involved with the political process. I still like to see my preference if it's not. A political revolution i don't have a lot of history of non-political revolutions that look bloodless and i'm not craving blood and so this is kind of why i participate in election processes still and pe the reason i hope that people like you get elected and go to legislature and you know and and move on to do great things and that inspire other people to do great things when they're like when they when they inspire people to have these liberty ideas because i think there's a lot of there's a lot of bad examples out there. And I think we yeah. get our hopes, we get our hopes tied to a lot of, I mean, even as libertarians, we've had our hearts broken by politicians millions of times. They like to flirt with us and then they'll just step on us, you know, just completely with one bill. And they're just like, oh, they just used us. They were using us the whole time. They had me fe feeling like, oh yeah, we're going to abolish ICE. And instead all we get is the biggest tax increase since 1942. I just, I, I believed better, you know what I mean? Like you just, and so I think it, it I understand why, why it, libertarians are kind of resistant to playing the political game, but I see it as very much a, a non bloody way. And 
I think there's a lot of worry that people, and I guess you can give me your thoughts on this too, Ashley, but there's a lot of thoughts that people are wasting their time when they could be doing it something else when they vote. And for me, voting takes so little time and effort that I'm not exactly sure that I understand. Of course, I've had the famous debate with Larkin Rose about voting and I was very much the for voting guy. And there's just, I, I sense so much paranoia that these people are so worried about like, oh, you're spending all this time voting, but you could be feeding the homeless. And I'm like, well, there's a very disproportionate amount of time involved between these two things. Uh, and, and I just, <laughs> I, don't, I don't see why you can't focus on both. You know, and I think you're a good example of this. Uh, I mean, full disclosure, not only am I on Ashley's campaign, but Ashley and I have been friends for a while. I I, I love her and that's why she's on the show. Uh, and, uh, you know, but but I think that there's people like you that, that do both. Like you say, you're very active in your community and it doesn't end at politics. And I think there's a great deal of worry that things end at politics. Like, th like politics, hey, as long as I'm politically active, that's all I need to do. Whereas really that's just kind of the, that's You're step one, box. if it's a step at all. Yeah. Right, right, if it's a step at all. You know, and so I guess, uh, Ashley, I'll let you, um, we're in our close, I'll let you give closing, whatever you want to say, um, send us off, how, whatever you want to tell people before before they hang up on you. What 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 do you feel that you want, to, want them to know that didn't come out in this uh, particular interview? Well, before we close, I, I want to touch based on you about this voting thing. Let's talk about this for a second. Sweet, okay? sweet, yes. So here's the deal. At the end of the day, what I want to do is help people. How can I help people? I can get involved in my community. I can have conversations with people. I can educate people. I can run for office and be visible and talk about the issues publicly. I can vote for people who believe in those ideas and principles and hope they follow through. Voting at the local level is a much safer and easier way to hold somebody accountable. It's very easy to hold people accountable in your own community. It's very difficult to hold senators and congressional people in office in Washington accountable. Uh, so being involved locally is really important. And local governments have more control. They're the ones that decide what ordinances and zoning laws and restrictions are in place here and that affect your daily lives. Um, they're the ones that decide how much your property taxes are or your business taxes and your commercial taxes. So if you don't vote, you're just letting people get into office without resistance who who might be against your interests in these areas it's important to run for office and to educate people on these issues but again it's also important to be involved in the community to have conversations to have discussions to go feed the homeless you can do both we have this wonderful thing in a lot of places called early voting and absentee ballots and if you have an opportunity to go early vote Please do, because you could basically walk into your voting place, whether that be uh, in a smaller community, maybe the town hall for early voting or wherever your polls are. You can literally walk in and walk out in 10 minutes and have voted and done your due diligence on your way to the to the uh, to the kitchen, to the soup kitchen to go feed the homeless. Right. I think we can all do that. It's about being smart. You don't have to vote on Election Day. There are many ways to vote before that, and they're all good. Please do. Uh, don't wait till the last minute to vote, especially in communities where you know the lines are very long. Take advantage of these other options that are available. The absentee ballots, the voting early. Now in places that they don't have early voting, that sucks. Elect people that'll change that. Voting should be easy. Voting should be the easiest thing that you do, other than breathing. You should be able to breathe and vote. <laughs> Very easy. Okay. Ashley Shade, everybody, fighting for your right to breathe and vote. <laughs> <laughs> and, and everybody should have that right to vote. There shouldn't be so many restrictions. You should be able to walk in, vote for who you want, and walk out and go do whatever you need to do. Um, so it's really important that we remember. Yes, I, I understand this argument. Voting is uh, voting. Voting is just putting somebody else in power. I get it. I don't trust power either. 
which is why I want to be a part of making sure power doesn't get out of control, which is why helping people is my ultimate goal. It's not about power to me. It's not about influence. It's not about being visible or well-known or well-liked. It's about helping people. And if you can elect people that genuinely care about others and about liberty, we're going to see different results. We're going to see communities change. We're going to see liberty expand and grow. And people are going to be grateful because not only do they get liberty, but the people that are promoting and voting and putting liberty into place are going to help the people in their communities with the things that they need directly. That's what it's about. That's that's what it's all about. At the end of the day, we all exist. If COVID has taught us anything, human beings are not meant to be isolated. For some unexplicable reason, we need each other. We need each other. And I could tell you, I would so much rather live in a society where people are lifting each other up, where they are willingly helping each other, where they are kind and courteous to each other, than living in a society where we're constantly tearing people down, insulting them, hating them. Which which life would you choose? Would you rather would you rather share love in the world? Would you rather share kindness? Would you rather have people be pleasant to you? Or would you rather have everybody be an asshole? I, I know which world I want to live in. In a world where we're all kind and where we help each other, it's a world where we can all grow and succeed together. Everybody can prosper. It doesn't just have to be certain people. Everybody can. And it doesn't have to slow you down from prospering either. It doesn't hurt to be kind. And it takes... Less effort to be nice than it does to be mean. So voting is important because that's how we affect change. For sure. Uh, Jordan, did you want to get anything final in before Ashley gave her closing closing thoughts? No, no, just uh, I wanted to thank you, Ashley, for, for joining us and giving us kind of the perspective of what it looks like to be running for local office as a, as a libertarian. I think that's something that um, a lot of people are, I'm sure, very interested in just to hear sort of the real world logistics of it all and, and sort of what your experiences has, has been. And um, I guess I personally just want to wish you the best of luck in, in the race to come. Thank you. I really appreciate that. So. Closing remarks, we all have them. People who have heard me on an interview have heard this before. But I'm gonna say it until you get sick of it. And hopefully that won't be ever. I believe in love. I believe that love is the brightest flame of liberty. And when we show people love, when we use compassion and education we light the path of liberty for others to travel down the road with us. When we show them love and we teach them, they're willing to travel down the road with us. And if our ultimate goal is liberty in our lifetimes, if we want people to travel down the road with us, we need to be willing to listen first. Listen first. And then educate and do so in a way that is kind, compassionate, and caring. Because people don't care about what you have to say until people know that you care. It's true. You have to reach people where they are and educate them down the road of liberty. And you can do so so much better through kindness and understanding than you can by being an asshole. I'm sorry, but it's true. <clears throat> so I want to leave you with this. If you believe, like I do, in compassion, education, and love, visit ashleyshade.com. Check out our issues. Check out what we're doing. Contribute to the campaign. If you can donate, please donate. If you want to volunteer, please reach out. Fill out our volunteer form. We are looking for more people to get involved. If you've never worked on a campaign before, we'd love to train you. If you have, we'd love to have you on board. We want the best people around. 
We want to do something that's never done been done before. Enough of politics where we insult each other, where everybody is the enemy, and where everybody else's ideas are terrible, stupid, and horrible. It's time to bring in a new generation of politics where we actually care about people first. And because we care about people, we do the right things to help them. And we do it to lead them down the road of liberty. So compassion, education, and love is that path. And together we can make that difference. And it's going to start right here in North Adams, Massachusetts. And it's going to continue to grow from there. And if we can understand and pick up this message of compassion, education, and love, everybody's going to jump on board with us because there are very few people in this world who think that is a bad thing. If you want to make a difference, learn to love, learn to be open-minded, listen, and help us get elected. If you're interested, please visit us on social media. The tag is A Shade, the number four office. That is our Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter handles. Uh, you can also find those on our website. Please go to the website and donate. Please do something tomorrow when you watch this, or when, maybe when you finish watching this. Do something to help somebody in your community. Anything, a small thing. Go, go. Help a neighbor unload their car. Have a conversation with somebody you haven't talked to for a while. Check in on somebody. Hey, how you doing? I hope all is well. I haven't heard from you in a while, and I was thinking about you. Do something kind for somebody else. And remember, if you're out there listening to this, it doesn't matter who you are or what your differences are or what race you are, what religion you are, whether you're gay or straight or bi or trans. We're all human beings on this planet. We all deserve dignity, respect, and love. And if you are out there, I want you to know that you are important, that you matter, and that I love you. Oh, we love you too, Ashley. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Really do appreciate it. It's uh, Love is a four-letter word, but it's not a bad one, and it's not one we nearly use enough. I think it was Mary Ruart who called the core principle of libertarianism the good neighbor policy. And I get a lot of sense of that when I talk to you. I, I do appreciate that. She did write my favorite libertarian book of all time. So <laughs> you are you are her spiritual successor. I, again, I really appreciate it. Jordan, I did want to say a special thank you and possibly goodbye to you. I know you were standing in for Aaron while he got things squared away. So thank you for being my resident lefty. Sure. Uh, we may call on you in the future if we have another hole or if his computer keeps oh, sucking. Sure. So. <laughs> but uh, thank you. I just wanted to thank you so much for staying in the show, reaching out to me. I, I, I appreciate that as well. Everybody so much. Uh, everybody, I, I love you. I thank you for listening to the show. If you're listening right now, we really appreciate you tuning in. Uh, visit Ashley Shade. Visit Jordan Kleinsmith. Visit Hody Johns. You can find us all on social media. Ask any questions you want. And uh, yeah, blow us up. Liberty can't get enough attention. Go ahead and ask us the tough questions. We live for them. Um, you all enjoy the rest of your day, and I will see you.